as a living sacrifice to God, our worship will not satisfy as it should. Because we do not, and we have not, given as we should. Remember, it is in giving that we receive. The joy and satisfaction which so many Christians lack can be received only by surrendering back to the Lord. Giving back what He has already given to us. When we surrender our body, our mind, our will to God as a living sacrifice, then we can truly render spiritual service. i give you an example of how God works on me sometimes. I keep a checkbook in my desk in my office. I know I'm going to get paid this week. So I got to get paid every week. So my goal is, when I'm sitting in my office, to open up that drawer and write out my tithe check. Sometimes I get busy in there. Sometimes I just plain forget. To write that check and then the offering plate comes around, I realize then I forgot to write that check. It bothers me for the rest of the week until the next Sunday comes around so I can make up for it. And God puts it on my mind that I'm not giving back what I've received. The first thing we're going to look at today is the basis of surrender. The grace of obedience is urged upon us by God's mercy. And in the beginning part of verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the people he is talking to here are the brethren. Those that are, have already accepted, accepted Christ as our Savior and received a new heart and a new inner desire. This command conveyed by beseech can only be obeyed by Christians, by those who already belong in God's family. Remember, you've heard me tell you before. We do not become children of God until we accept Christ as our Savior. The Bible tells us that. So you, when you hear from unbelievers out there in the world that we're all children of God, they are wrong. We're all created by God. But the Bible makes it real clear, and Paul wrote this, that when we accept Christ as our Savior at that point, we become children of God. Until then, we are children of Satan in the world. So Paul is writing this to the children of God. Now, what are some of the mercies that we read about in the book of Romans? In the previous 11 chapters, it talks about it. We have received the grace. We, Jesus died in our place. We have been forgiven. We have been justified freely by faith. We have been reconciled with Christ. We have been given eternal life. We've been conformed to the image of God's Son. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We have an intercessory in our lives now called Jesus Christ. And God has poured into our hearts His love. Having all things working for good and possesses His love that cannot be separated from us. Once we accept Christ, His love cannot be taken from us. And we cannot be taken from Him. So we have received faith, peace, hope, a share in Christ's righteousness and in His glory. And we can call God Father because we are His children. These are the mercies we receive as a child of God. The most compelling motivation for faithful, obedient living should not be the threat of discipline from God or the rewards that we think we, that we will receive in heaven but it should come from overflowing and unceasing attitude for what God and His mercies have done for us. Such mercy should motivate and empower believers to completely surrender and commit themselves to God. Not just partially. Not just halfway. Not just sitting in front of someone, but completely to the Lord. The second is the act of surrender. And we look at the second part of verse 1. It says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now that living sacrifice, that's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? It says two different things here, but we are to be a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God. 
which is your reasonable service. Verse 1 commands us to act and surrender for the mercy that we receive from God. It urges us and empowers us to fully surrender our life to God and His service. Believers are called upon to present and surrender their body as a living sacrifice. This is only proper, logical, and appropriate response for one who has received the mercies of God that He's given us. When someone asks William Booth, the, the founder of the Salvation Army, the secret of his success, Booth remained silent for several moments. Then, with tear-filled eyes, he said this, there have been men with greater brains or opportunities than I. But I made up my mind that God will have all the William Booth there is. <clears throat> Several years later, William Booth's daughter heard that about her father's comment regarding his full surrender to God. And this is what she said. She said, that wasn't really his secret. His secret was is that he never took it back. Once he gave his life to God, he never took it back. Here's what we do sometimes as Christians. We walk that off for the first time, and we accept Christ as our Savior, and we ask God for forgiveness for our sins. We give ourselves completely to God, but then our Christian walk, we start taking it back from him, little by little by little. The word we were only giving him 75% or 50% or maybe 25%. We have moved and never took it back. The problem is, that's the problem with living as a sacrifice. It can't get off that altar. When we come forward, we're laying our lives on that altar for God as a living sacrifice. Yet we, like William Booth, can respond to God's grace and mercy and say this by giving Him our all and never taking it back. Since we are a living sacrifice, we must daily lay down our own desires and put our energy and resources at God's disposal. In his hymn, Elisha Hoffman asks this, Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control? Those are two very good questions. We have to ask ourselves, how would we answer these questions? What has, we have to ask ourselves, what has God done for us? In what ways have you been living for yourself and not for God? What are the rewards of living for God? In consideration of all that the Lord and His mercy has done for us. What are we, we are to give our bodies as a living sacrifice to God and not take it back. <clears throat> Christ showed his love for us when he died on that cross 2,000 years ago. We need to show ours by living for him. God is not asking for that much. Jesus gave it all for us in Calvary. By bodies, all means not just our skins and bones. But our total being needs to be sacrificed to God. Our bodies are not just a physical being, but our mind, our emotions, and our will needs to be turned over to God. Before we trusted Christ, we used to present our bodies to sin and to sinful ways, to pleasures and purposes of the world. But now that we belong to God, we need to use our bodies for His glory, not our own. Just as Jesus Christ did upon himself. A body in order to accomplish God's will on earth. So we must also yield our body to God. As an instrument of righteousness. To be used by God. We need to offer our feet to walk in his path. Our lips to speak to, of his truth. And spread the gospel, our tongues to bring healing, our hands to lift up the fallen and perform service as he directs, our arms to, to, to embrace the lonely and the unloved, 
our ears to listen to his word and the cries of distress and, and our eyes to humbly look up to him obediently. The Lord created our bodies for himself, for his pleasure. He, and in this life, he cannot work through us without at some point working through our body that we need to give to him. We are to offer our body as a living and holy sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the priest would take an animal, place it on the altar on behalf of the person who brought the animal sacrifice. Then they would sacrifice that animal for that person's sins. But that sacrifice of an animal is no longer accepted by God. I really believe that is why Jerusalem was destroyed after the death of Christ. The temple was destroyed. And still the temple has not been rebuilt because God will no longer accept that as a sacrifice for that altar. The Lamb of God was sacrificed in our place and redeemed to the Lord as an offer for ourselves. All that they have and all that we are should be a living sacrifice to God. Where true worship starts under the new covenant, which started with Christ, it needs to be an offering of ourselves to God as, again, as a living sacrifice. Lord Jesus sacrificed his life for us. He actually died as a sacrifice in our place, but he was being obedient to his father when he did it. He's obedient to his father's will. But the thing is, he rose again on the third day. Today he's in heaven as a living sacrifice, but on his body he still bears the wounds he received on Calvary that day. He still has the piercings in his hands and his feet. He still has the spear mark in his side where they stuck him with that spear to make sure he was dead. The living sacrifice we are to offer the Lord who died for us is the willingness to surrender to Him. Surrender our hopes, our plans, everything that is precious to us. needs to be surrendered to God. And as we die daily to our old self, the world, the flesh, the devil, we become a living and holy sacrifice to God. A holy sacrifice means a sacrifice set apart for special purpose. <coughs> There's a special purpose for each and every one of us. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we need to accept that. What is that purpose? I was listening to the radio when I took Pam down to see the foot doctor on Thursday. And they were talking about this girl that came to this pastor and wanted to know what she should be doing for God. He said, don't talk to me about it. Talk to God. He said, go find yourself a dark place. All by yourself. And then spend the next few hours talking and listening to God. And let God tell you what your purpose is. In Peter Dyson's book, The Priority of Knowing God, he tells of an occasion when President Eisenhower was addressing the National Press Club. He opened his remarks by apologizing because he was not a great speaker. Then he told his audience that his situ situation reminded him of his boyhood experience he had on a Kansas farm. Isaiah recalled an old farmer that had a cow for sale that they wanted to buy. He said, we went over to visit him and asked about the cow's pedigree. The old farmer didn't know what pedigree meant. So we asked him about the cow's butterfat production. The old farmer told us, told them he didn't have any idea. Finally, we asked him if he knew how many pounds of milk the cow produced a year. The farmer shook his head and said, I don't know. But she's an honest cow, and she'll give you all the milk she has. <laughs> Eisenhower concluded his open remarks with this. Well, I'm like that cow. I'll give you everything I have. We need to be like that cow, too, and give God everything we have. Amen. The Lord doesn't expect from us any more than what we have to offer. And each one of us has something different to offer. But he does want us to be faithful and to give him our very best in everything. We need to willingly say and gladly say to the Lord, 
I give you my life and everything I have now is yours. You know, when we give our offering and tithes on Sunday morning, we're not giving to God, we're returning to God. I heard that this morning I was talking to somebody, that's a very good point. We're not giving to Him, we're returning to Him. Because everything we had came from Him. Everything. Including our life. There's an old hymn called Give Your Best to the Master. In the hymn it says, Give Him first place in your heart. Give Him first place in your service. So often we do just the opposite. We don't give God first place in our heart. We definitely don't give Him first place in our service. Because it gets in the way of everything else we want to do. In fact, when we give service to God, it should be way down on the list. And some people, I don't even know if it makes the top ten. There's a saying I heard a lot when I was playing football and basketball. On the line. It's something I dreaded to hear from the coach. You know, the coach might say at the beginning of practice, he might say in the middle of practice, or he might say at the end of practice. It's three words that can strike fear in an athlete in high school, trust me. Or even in college. And just when you think you're safe to take a breather during practice, the coach yells, on the line. So you drag yourself to, to either the end of the basketball court or the goal line on the football field. Then you wait to hear whether you're going to face wind sprints or suicides. Or some other form of torture. You know, it's one thing for sure. You're going to run until you're ready to drop. Or throw up. So why do athletes present themselves to coach day after day and say, that it's okay, coach. Do with me what you want. Run me to the ground if you must. I'm here to do what you say. They do it because they know the coach has their best interests in heart. And only through his wise direction can they succeed on the basketball court or the football field. Athletes and and training is a great picture of the Christian life. Believers are to be a living sacrifice. They are to give themselves to their coach, which is Jesus Christ. And just as an athlete is successful only to the extent that he listens and puts his life into the hands of the coach for a couple hours a day, so is the Christian successful when they put their lives in the hands of God. So we have to do it 24 hours a day. So we all have to ask ourselves, have we presented our bodies as a living sacrifice to God? Are we willing to put our lives on the line for Him so He can make us a world-class Christian that He wants us to be? When you offer your life as a living sacrifice, you will receive more than you give, trust me. David Livingston, the famous missionary to Africa, wrote in his journal one time, People talk of the sacrifice I made of spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called sacrifice, which is simply paid back as a small part of the great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings us no reward of a healthy activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? What a word, what a view, what a thought. It is in fact no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with the relinquishing of indulgences of this life may cause the spirit to waver and sink, but only for a moment. All these are nothing when compared to the glory which will soon be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not talk, but remember the great sacrifice which he made, who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. He wrote that in about 1851. But like Livingston Christians who offer a living sacrifice to themselves, usually do not consider it to be a sacrifice. It is not a sacrifice in the common sense of losing something valuable. It is only that it is only things we entirely give up to God. 
only things we give up are sin and sinful things, which only bring us injury and death. But when we offer God ourselves as a living sacrifice, He does not destroy what He gives, what we give to Him. But what He does, He refines it and He purifies it. Not only for His glory, but for our own present and eternal good. Each one of us has a gift that God has given us. And by being a living sacrifice, we allow God to use that gift that He's given us. True worship does not consist of elaborate and impressive <coughs> prayers. I remember being in church as a young man or a young child. And here the pastor calling somebody to do the closing prayer. Whether they're worshiping God in that prayer, they worship themselves. They would see thee, they would say things like thee and thou and thus and pray like they were preaching and they were reading out the Old Testament. But rather than giving glory to God, they bring glory upon themselves. True worship does not need to include stained glass, lighted candles, worn robes, classic, classical sacred music. It does not require great talent, skill, or even leadership ability. <coughs> Those outward forms may be genuine, affirm genuine worship, but they alone are not acceptable, acceptable to God. Only after the worshiper has offered their being, their whole self, as a living sacrifice does it become pleasing to God. While visiting Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the White House, Wendell Wilkie asked him, Mr. President, why do you keep that frail, sickly man, Harry Hopkins, at your elbow? President Roosevelt replied, Mr. Wilkie, through that door flows daily an incessant stream of men and women who almost invariably want something from me. Harry Hop Hopkins wants only to serve me. That is why he is so dear to me. It's the same way with God. God has always been asked for things by people, men and women continually. But those that, he, that want to serve him that he's closest to. In our scripture this morning, the Apostle Paul exhorts believers on the basis of God's mercies to give their bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice. He calls that our reasonable service. We should be driven by such love for God and gratitude for God for what He's done for us that we want to serve Him. Is your Christian service motivated by a sense of obligation or duty? Are you working merely to gain praise and approval of others? Do we desire to make a name for ourselves? Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us determine what our motives are when we do work for Him. Then, we'll make sure that we are serving out of love and not out of selfishness. You may try to serve God without loving Him, but you cannot love God without serving Him. Third, third, the transformation also leads to surrender. Verse 2 begins by stating two indications of believers who have surrendered their life to God's service. And one says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Offering or surrendering your life to God causes a new direction in your life. And sometimes it leads to a new lifestyle. Because the lifestyle we live in is not acceptable, acceptable to God. This dress is not simply a goal or a new manner of living. We are shown that we must, what we must do to obtain the goal. This new direction is needed because the world wants to control our mind. It wants to control our life. God wants to transform our minds. The world wants to conform your mind to its way of thinking. And then for me, there's too many Christians that have gone that way. There's too many churches that have gone the way that they want to allow the world to control their minds. 
There's a great denomination in this country right now that's about ready to split right down the middle because half of the God, half the denomination wants to follow what the world is telling them to follow. And you have the other half that wants to follow God. And unfortunately, it's going to lead to a great denomination that's going to be split right down the middle. God wants us to transform our minds so that we can think clearly. The world seeks to pressure us into its mold and its way. The world seeks to conform us to the mass thoughts that it has. The opinion, standards, speculation, hopes, its, its impulses, aims, and aspirations, which pressure us from all sides. In fact, Paul even writes about being pressured from all sides as a Christian. But we must not be conformed to the things of the world. Yet this dominant is so powerful that how can we resist its influence? The verse continues when it says, be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Like the caterpillar transforms itself into a butterfly. The key to this change is in the mind. The outward transformation is affected by the inner change of our mind. The control center of our attitudes, our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. When we give ourselves to God, it's going to be everything, including our mind. So how does this God renew our mind? You know, it's really simple. God transforms our mind and makes us spiritually minded by His Word. This book right here. As you listen to God's words, you need to meditate on it. Memorize it. God's Spirit renews the mind and the way you live is transformed by His Word. His renewed mind allows us to see ourselves and others in the world from the perspective of Jesus Christ and, and His cross which will replace our delight in our sins. In fact, when we follow God, we'll look at our sins with hatred. Instead of rejecting sinners, we'll, we will have a love for them. We are to allow the transforming Word of God to work within us and produce outward results. Instead of permitting the external pressures to conform to the world, Satan uses the world to try to get us to change. But if we meditate on God's words daily, it will influence our thoughts. It will help us grow and be more like Jesus Christ. Then you will be able to prove the wonder of God's will to the doubting world. How can we show the doubting world about Jesus Christ that when we leave this church or any church, that we hang our Christianity at the door and we go out and we act like the world. We talk like the world. We tell jokes like the world. Sometimes we are the only word of God that people will ever see is by our actions and our deeds and our words. If we are trans truly transformed by the word, we will not be conformed by the world. Finally, the proof of surrender. First, two concludes by teaching us that the purpose of the transformed life is to demonstrate the life of doing God's will. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what that is, is that a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Those whose mind the Holy Spirit has renewed, re-educated and redirected, if you allow that to happen, the results of your life will be that you can prove what the will of God is in your life. This renewed mind means that you can not only know God's will, but you'll be able to live in God's will. And you'll know what God's will is for your life. We can live out God's will and prove the following three qualities of God's will. We can prove that God's will is good, that it's pleasing to God, and that is perfect. As a Christian is transformed in his mind, is made more like Jesus Christ, he becomes not only 
comes not only to approve of God's will, but it allows God's will to work through him. And his life will prove it. But how does this happen? Well, your mind controls your body, doesn't it? And your will and power controls your mind. You may think that you can control your will by the willpower of your will. But the thing is, our will will fail sooner or later. It's only when we yield our will to God that His power, which is the Holy Spirit within us, can take over. And He can give us the willpower and the want power. No, we got to want it too. That we worship in spirit and truth and live the victorious Christian life, which is good, is acceptable, and is perfect. We can surrender our will to God through disciple prayer and discipline prayer. As we spend time in prayer, we learn to know and trust God and, and we surrender our will to Him. And by praying, just like Jesus taught the disciples, not your will, but not my will, but your will be done. An architect, architect said one time that his clients who asked him to design a house had already made the plans in their minds. What they really wanted was, a, was approval of their plans. What they really wanted was approval of their own ideas and the satisfaction of seeing him draw what they thought would suit their needs. Some Christians proceed in the same way when they ask the divine architect, which is God, to plan their life. They pray for wisdom, they pray for guidance, but in their heart they have already decided how they will attain their goals and what goals they should and what goals they should be pursuing. They have missed the message of Romans 1, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. While they gladly trust Christ for salvation, they hold back from making the full surrender to God. It is necessary to prove what is good, acceptable, and, and perfect will of God. A young girl attended a meeting in which she was challenged to yield completely to Christ. She wanted to do God's will, but, but feared he might lead her into something she wouldn't like. After the service, Stephen Olford, the speaker, talked with her and said, read Romans 12, 2 carefully. And you will see that it is the good will of God that will be your portion. While it may not be an easy role, it will be acceptable to Him and bring the joy to you that you are seeking. He quoted John Matheson hymn, Make me a captive, O Lord. Over it came to the words, My will is not my own. Till thou hast made it thine. Suddenly it made sense to her. With tears she prayed, Thank you, God. I'm all yours. Question is, have you surrendered everything to Him? Only as we go God's way can we know what God's will is for us. To sum things up, Paul, Paul's appeal is addressed to the people of God based on the mercies of God and concerned with the will of God. Only a clear vision of His mercies will inspire us to present our bodies fully, completely to Him and allow Him to tr transform us according to His will and not our own. As a Christian is transformed in his mind and is made more like Christ, he comes to desire God's will, not his own will for his life. Then he discovers that God's will is what is good for him. God's will is not for something bad for us. God wants something good for us. He has perfect plans for his children. But only by being renewed spiritually can we ascertain it. Can we do it and enjoy the will of God? Being a child of God is not always easy. God never promises that it is going to be perfect. 
Psalm 23 says, I didn't want to use this, but Psalm 23 says, it talks about the valley of death. But God leads us through it. As Christians, we should not fear because we do have God. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. We just have to follow His will. God wants the eternal best for us. And because He has demonstrated His mercy in Jesus, we should joyfully give ourselves as a living sacrifice. God has good, pleasing, and perfect plans for His children. It's not always our plans. It's not always easy. Sometimes there's some major bumps in that road. But He uses those bumps to perfect us. He wants to transform people by renewing of the mind so that they will live and honor and obey Him. This morning we start our invitation to stand up with, with me as we prepare for our invitation. And with head bowed and eyes closed, I have some questions for you. Have you ever presented your body as a living sacrifice? If you haven't, will you do that today? Are you seeking God's grace to take the necessary steps to allow Jesus to renew your mind? But here's the biggest question. To enjoy God's mercies and will in your life, you first must accept Christ as your Savior. And ask God for forgiveness of your sins. Have you done that? To be in God's will, first you must become a child of God, which means you have to accept Christ as your Savior and ask God to forgive you of your sins. And you have to do that publicly. Because she says, if you profess me before a man, I will profess you before, before God. And that's why we ask you to do it publicly at church. Just step out and come down the house.